Hello, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Surviving Scientology Radio with your host, Jeffrey Augustine. Today we have on with us Nathan Rich, author of the new book, Scythe Telepo, My Survival of Occult, Abandonment, Addiction, and Homelessness. Welcome to the show, Nathan. Hey, thanks, Jeffrey. Hey, everybody. N Nathan, your book is uh, just unbelievably existential. I mean, this is you have been through hell and back. You were born into Scientology. So. Yeah, I was I was born into uh, an all Scientology family. Um, my grandmother was OT8. My mother was OT3. Uh, you know, my aunt was in the Sea Org. Uh, my cousin was in the Cadet Org. My other aunt was like OT5 when I was very young. So, uh, and then my father's side of the family that was already disconnected from. Um, so, I was raised with a, a very small family, and all of them were Scientologists, uh, with the exception of, of my grandfather. Nathan, what's your first memory in this life? What's the first thing you remember? So the first thing that I remember is actually relevant as well, um, which is actually being in session. I, I, I recall being in session um, in, in Hollywood, and uh, at the time, my mother... Uh, was, you know, I, I would go into session with these sort of field auditors and uh, I was, my, my memory was being on the ground in the auditing room on, on some carpet and I was uh, crying and I, I didn't want to be there and I, I just remember like wanting to be outside and play and not wanting to be in that room. Um, so kind of as, as sort of stereotypical as it sounds, I mean, that's that's what I remember. Well, I, I have never heard that from anyone I've interviewed. So you're, I mean, as a child, do you even know what auditing is or did they tell you what they're trying to do? Well, at that time, obviously, I, I didn't know exactly what auditing was, but I, I, I just had an idea that whatever I was doing in this room for my mom with some guy wasn't I just felt like it wasn't normal like it wasn't what the up uh, my uh, my friends were doing you know they were outside playing with the ball and and doing whatever and I was I was doing some stuff in this room and I had apparently been doing it before because I remember at that time even feeling like I'm tired of this you know I want to go play you know I can relate I I remember being a, a very young child uh it's not the first thing I remember, but it's a very early memory of being in a, a Methodist church with my parents. And uh, they did communion. So you're supposed to eat, eat bread and, or, and grape juice. And it was really serious and scary because I didn't know what it meant. It was like, Jesus died and then we're going to do this. Uh, and I, I didn't know someone died so we do this and it made no sense and it was scary was so auditing was it's not something you wanted to do was it scary to you as a child no um you know the thing about your experience there is you know they're bringing death into it and and there's a lot of sort of mystery about it for me my experience with or you know auditing when i was very young was more just it was just something I was doing that I just didn't want to do. It wasn't really scary to me or, um, you know, uh, or, or mystical or mysterious. It was just whatever this guy is doing, I, I don't want to do that. I want to go and, and, and be, you know, yeah. normal. I mean, I, I didn't think about it as normal, but I wanted to go do normal stuff, you know. I can relate to that. That's what, what I wanted to be doing, and I didn't know what death, burial, and resurrection was, so... Now, your parents were OTs, and I'll ask you this, because I've interviewed a lot of uh, people who, who grew up in the Sea Org, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, who grew up in the Sea Org, and they were obviously throwaway children. Their parents had to do full-time Sea Org duty, but you, you weren't, how, what was your relationship to your parents? How did they treat you? So my father, uh, I never knew him. I met him once in my late, uh, in, in my mid-twenties, hmm. um, which I, in, I initiated. 
So he was completely out because he had been disconnected from. I mean, he was a Scientologist when I was a baby. Uh, and, you know, by the time I had any memories, he was already gone. All of my photos that I have, um, you know, from back then, he's cut out of all of them. In fact, I hadn't even seen a picture of him until I met him in, uh, you know, like I said, in my 20s. So he was called, totally gone. Um, my mother and I, you know, I have no siblings. So, and, and the rest of the family lived in other states than us. So my early life was, you know, my mother and me. That's all it was. And, uh, and my cats. So she was... Uh, she was working. Um, she used to work at a fount at, at a place called Fountain Press on uh, Fountain Avenue in, in Hollywood, which was a printing press for those of us old enough to know what that is. Um, <laughs> and that was a Scientology run uh, company. I grew up in the Shangri Lodge, which is a tiny apartment complex right next to uh, the Celebrity Center. Um, and so my early days were spent in that gower area of um of hollywood running around in the you know going to the manor and aola and um celebrity center and all that kind of stuff and her you know she was busy working at when i was very young she worked at some kind of bar or restaurant um and then she and then she started working at this fountain press place um and, you know, I, I had to be looked after. I got kicked out of uh, most of the Scientology schools that I went to. So I actually spent a lot of my early years in daycare centers. Um, one was called uh, Stan's Daycare Center, which was um, for a very small group of people in L.A. They all know that, that daycare center. It was pretty uh, popular amongst Scientologists in the 80s. So I spent a lot of time alone. A lot of time in daycare centers, um, but I loved my mother a lot. I mean, I, she was my everything. She was just the the biggest thing in the world to me. Um, so we had a very unique and um, kind of special relationship. And of course, when you're three and you're four years old, it's difficult to put into perspective that your relationship is different than other people's relationships with their parents. So to me, I just felt like this was just a very special, unique, and kind of um, powerful relationship. And I, I wasn't really conscious of, is it different or better or worse than anybody else's, you know? No, and in childhood, you, you, you uncritically accept the world you, you, you come up in. You don't question things. Did you know what Scientology was? Did your, did your mother tell you it was a religion or? How did she explain Scientology to you? So, um, when I was, uh, you know, three or so, I was I was doing some Scientology, you know, activities, but I I, I didn't have the capacity to have any sort of conversation about it. But I, I, as early as I can remember of knowing anything about the world and the universe and how things work. It was already completely intertwined with Scientology. It took me many decades to parse and separate things out and realize what was actually Scientology beliefs and what was actually sort of mainstream beliefs. Um, so when I was, you know, kind of the heyday of my childhood, I would say, like the sort of the, the time period that I go to when I think about myself as a child was when I was about five years old. And I was living, like I said, at the um, Shangri Lodge on Tamarin Avenue across from uh, Celebrity Center. And, and in those days, um, you know, I, I did a lot of exploration of reality, a lot of asking why, a lot of, but why this, well, why that, but how does that work, but what about this? And 100% of the answers that I got came from my mother. And she was, um, she was a fully, you know, she, she was a complete believer in Scientology, um, which, again, at the time, I didn't know if that was more or less than other people. In more recent years, I've discovered that she was probably more of a believer than most public, uh, you know, non org Scientologists. So she was very, very much um, down with, with, with LRH, you could say. So the way that it, Scientology came into my life was completely organically, meaning... If I said, hey, um, how did the dinosaurs go extinct? 
she would tell me, oh, uh, it, you know, they think it was this or that. Because, of course, back in the 80s, actually, they didn't really, they hadn't settled on the sort of asteroid theory. Um, so it could have been this, it could have been that. And, um, and of course, one of the things that it could have been was a Phaeton, um, you know, coming down and wiping them out and clearing, you know, clearing the path for, for humans to, to evolve. This type of thing where it just was part of, science and nature like i asked about the ice age and she told me that it, that it was from a thetan who had ripped a hole in the ozone layer and sucked all the air out you know um but if i had asked about you know uh if chips are healthy or if crackers are healthy then she would have told me probably crackers are healthy i mean it was just it was just that weight that sort of heaviness it was exactly the same as any other factor just basic principle of how everything worked and so that's kind of one of the keys for how i think you know how ch children are indoctrinated with belief is that it's not even really it's not shown to be a belief it's not like my mother said oh you know crackers are more healthy than chips and i believe that the ice age was caused this way it's just this happened and that happened and here's another true thing and here's another true thing. So I didn't even really think of it as a religion or a belief system or anything. I just thought that's just how the world worked. I can understand that. Now, now getting into uh, your, your grade school years, did you go to public school like in kindergarten, first grade and so on? So I skipped preschool. I spent that those years in daycare. Or that year in daycare. Uh, my first year was at uh, Mace Kingsley Preparatory Academy in LA, which was, you know, obviously started by Debbie Mace and Carol Kingsley. Um, and I didn't finish that grade. Uh, and then my, you know, I, I basically, long story short, I spent most of my schooling in Scientology schools with the occasional one or two public schools. And I actually got kicked out of. Um, all of the schools that I went to uh, until seventh grade. Um, and I skipped preschool, second grade, and fifth grade. Um, so by the time I finished the seventh grade, it was the first grade I had actually ever finished. Huh, that's, well, why were you getting kicked out of school? Behavioral problems, fighting, uh, academic performance? It was uh, backflash, which uh, non-Scientologists would know by the uh, another word that means literally the exact same thing, backtalk. So um, I, I always describe that word, that word backflash, as just a, the most pointless Scientology word. Um, well, yeah, normally so it means, it means you're being, back. yeah, you're being defiant. Yeah. So my thing in school, uh, at, you know, in elementary school, was that. I kind of had a couple of problems. One w was that in those days, I was very, very bright kid. Um, and I was spending all that energy, the sort of brain power that I had when I was a youngster, I was spending it on doing these courses. And every time that I would go to a new school, it's just the same courses again and again, learning how to learn you know, how to communicate, ups and downs of life or, or whatever, all these little like starter Scientology courses. And I just, I, I was interested in animals. You know, I wanted to, I, I used to read zoo books, this old magazine, I, and I wanted to know about dinosaurs and animals and science and, um, you know, space and those types of things. I didn't care about, oh, here's how you use a dictionary and here's how you you know, an overt causes this and that, and here's the cycle of action. It's like, I don't care about that. I want to know about cool stuff, you know? And so I had, that was a big problem for me. And then the other problem that I had was the teachers um, in these Scientology schools were very much, you know, poised against that. They, they wanted to teach Scientology and they just wanted to teach the bare state minimum of non-Scientology subjects. And um, you know, I just was getting overwhelmed with Scientology. It was in my home life. It was my view of everything. It was being crammed down my throat in schools. I was going into auditing. I, you know, it was just too much. And I just, I didn't, you know, 
I didn't try to fight back. I just didn't really want it. And um, it became, you know, there's something incompatible about the way that my mind worked back then and how it still works now. Um, it was something incompatible with that. And the way that these teachers approached subjects and the way that a lot of course supervisors and other Scientology, you know, instructors approach subjects, which is that they come from the position that the, that the information they have is 100% correct and you're wrong if you disagree with it or even ask questions about it. And I was such an inquisitive kid that I just couldn't accept that. And, and so there's just a really big incompatibility between the way that they are teaching me things and the way that I really wanted to learn things. Sure, in a bright child, your experience sounds like it was very suffocating, very confining, especially if you're inquisitive because Scientology is not about let's inquire into the world and learn. Let's, instead, it's like you said, getting data shoved down your throat and duplicating it and spitting it back, which I imagine would be a problem for any curious, bright child. Now, just a side question, did you learn how to read and write fairly quickly when you were in grade school? Yeah, I, I picked it up. I mean, you know, I, I think I probably learned to read and write you know, writing probably the same rate as any other kind of kid. I mean, looking back on my old schoolwork, you know, I've got backwards letters and all that kind of stuff at, at approximately, I'd say, the same rate as, as a normal kid. Um, reading was always, uh, I, was, I always kind of had a leg up on reading, which partially had to do with the fact that I was always reading these courses and always reading, you know, uh, this kind of stuff and trying to get through Scientology bulletins at home and, and HCOPLs and all these types of things. I was trying to learn, but I didn't have the tools yet because I was very young. So I picked up, I picked up uh, I'd say writing probably an average speed and then reading I picked up uh, much quicker. Um, and I just want to say also that as far as behavior in, in school, um, you know, Scientology came out with a video attacking me and in it they say many things. Uh, some of them are true, but out of order intention intentionally some of them are completely false and one of the false things that they say is like oh he he was in trouble at school for he was hitting kids that's never happened i've never been uh hitting kids in any class so that's uh that that's not true i didn't have those types of behavioral issues i wasn't like a a fighter i wasn't one of those sort of reactionary kids that's you know gets in your face and tries to attack i was just like rebellious against the teaching methods and didn't want to be there. I didn't even have any real friends in school because I hopped around so much that I didn't have friends or enemies. I was pretty much just always nobody even knew who I was, you know? Sure, and, and just in terms of um, Scientology's fair game hate pages, uh, they contain so many lies. And, and this is one of the problems with the Office of Special Affairs and the system of Scientology itself is L. Ron Hubbard has a policy finder manufacturer, which means that they'll just make up stuff to lie about people, to slander people, to defame them. And that's one of the reasons Scientology is so self-destructive is it cannot tell the truth. And, um, and I don't want to get off on that till later. But to go back into your childhood and say you were you were fighting in the absence of any records or statements or corroboration, it, we just ignore that, right? Um, yeah, for me, it's yeah, I was going to say for me, it's like, they, you know, they can say whatever they want and, uh, you know, good, good luck to them. But I, I hope I think and I hope that when people listen to me talk, they find a couple of things. One, he seems like an honest guy. Uh, two, he is telling us things that, you know, he, he may have done wrong, things that are incriminating to him. I mean, I'm no angel. Um, and so why would he be choosing a few things to say that were lies if they weren't actually lies? I mean, I, what, you know, if you, if you kind of follow some of my videos and some of the way that I talk about things, um, I'm, I'm very open about who I, who I was in the past and who I am now. And I, you know, I don't care if I was actually fighting as a kid, I would just say it. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have any bearing on, on me. I don't, I wouldn't care. It's just, uh, so I, I, I hope that people can see that, that, you know, um, I don't have any reason to sort of 
uh, lie about things just because Scientology said them. I mean, some of the stuff they said was true. You know, um, I did get kicked out of schools when I was young. I did have, uh, you know, issues fitting in into, into you know, uh, the Scientology schools and whatnot. It's just most of the stuff that they said, they twisted around and tried to change the timelines. And then, and then there were some just total ball-faced lies where I was like, what are they even talking about? This is crazy. Yep, I know how that uh, how that game goes. So seventh grade, you finish. Uh, how's your relationship with your mom through junior high, high school? Well, so by seventh grade, by the way, I, I had already been sent to the ranch. Uh, so I, I kind of was skipping ahead because we're talking about um, uh, schooling. Um, oh, okay, yeah. But yeah, so I, I got sent away to the ranch when I was eight. Um, and so, uh, by the time I was out of, you know, by the time I was out of there, my whole life had changed dramatically. And, um, I was, you know, I had moved to Florida and all, all kinds of other stuff happened that I, that I outlined in the book as well. But, um, seventh grade was the first school that I actually did well at, at a school called Dunedin Academy. And, um... You know, Dunedin Academy was a non-Scientology school, and it was in Dunedin, Florida, which is a, kind of a, a city next to Clearwater. And I just had it. I kind of got the thing that I always wanted that I never really knew how to articulate, which is I had a private school that emphasized individualized, um, you know, learning rates and individual attention and good behavior. And I just found that in a wonderful teacher named Frank Unitowski, and I flourished. Um, you know, this is 1993 that we're talking about now. So I was 11 years old when I entered that school. And before that year, like I said, I had, I had never finished a, a single school year. And I, my grade averages were C's and D's, you know, and down. I, I was just not a good student. Um, at these other places and my relationship with my with my mother at that point you know I had been sent to the to the Mace Kingsley Ranch um, and then I missed a, a that obviously you know that year of schooling and then I moved to Florida and tried to go to another Scientology school called A to B school which didn't work out and then um, it was a bit strained but my grandfather had died so I had to kind of keep in my pain and and um, experiences from the ranch. I had to kind of just suffer it because ev the whole family was reeling over the loss of my grandfather. Mm. So I was kind of just on my own emotionally, and I was really starting to boil over. But then I found this school, and I found this new challenge of, okay, Nathan, this is the thing you've always been saying that is actually the thing that you need. You know, this is it. You're in a private school. So go ahead. And, and I took on that challenge. Um, and the seventh grade was a huge turning point for me. Um, my grades went to, you know, uh, high B's and, and, and A's in one year, which was, you know, for me, quite remarkable. Um, sure. And then the next year at the same school, eighth grade, uh, you know, I was, I was, I tested into college level in my standardized tests for every subject. And I got, I went from B's and A's to A's and then A pluses. And, and by the end of that year, I was literally had A pluses in every single subject. And they named me the, the junior high valedictorian. So I had turned around this entire, um, ship of, not having good grades and not doing well in school. And, you know, I'm not trying to like say, oh, I was right the whole time or anything because I was just a kid. I didn't really know what I wanted, but I felt like I wanted a private school with individualized attention that didn't focus on Scientology. And as soon as I got that, my grades went from, you know, mediocre to poor, you know, poor all the way to absolutely stellar in, in every subject. Yeah, and I think that when, it, when a child especially a, a, a bright child has self-study. They're allowed to do what they're interested in. They're not having Scientology shoved down their throat or 
Catholicism, whatever, they will improve naturally because they're motivated to, they're interested. And children tend to resist being forced into studying dreary subjects day in and day out. That's just human nature. So what, so what happens, uh, you're the valedictorian in middle school, and then what happens when you go to high school? So that was a, a turn for the, for the worse. Um, so the private school I was in was a K-12 uh, school, meaning they had every grade, basically. And, you know, seventh and eighth grade, I had the same teacher. I had a strong connection with him. I, uh, I knew his teaching methods. He had, you know, he had a lot of discipline over the class. It was just a great environment for me to learn. And uh, as the freshman year came around, uh, every, all that changed. Every class was with a different um, teacher. Um, and I didn't know a lot of those teachers. I, I didn't, you know, I just didn't, I wasn't ready for that. And so I was panicking because, you know, the, the discipline of those other uh, teachers was kind of out. And, um, and I, I just saw that I didn't really have a chance. So I tried to, you know, I asked my mother for emancipation. I tried to get out of that situation and kind of, okay, maybe I can just start working and be a man. So when I was 13 or 14, I asked her about that. And, you know, she freaked out and was like, you know, no way, are you crazy? You know, and, hmm. and actually put, pushed me. And um, so I kind of uh, went back to the drawing board and tried to figure out, okay, what can I do to get out of this crazy school life because it had it had deteriorated to the point where I mean I got thrown out of a window at school it was an open window but I was thrown out of it on the first floor and the, the kid that did that didn't even get in trouble you know it was, wow. it was just it was the type of school where it's like all right this is not working there's kids in the back selling drugs and I, it just was falling apart so um, anyway so I I told my mom what about if I join the Sea Org because I knew that Sea Org people actually didn't really get services done, but they have a place that they can stay. And on top of everything, my family would actually be happy that I did that. So I kind of, it just seemed like a win win situation. I maybe earn a little bit of money, have my own place, uh, have a job during the day, maybe new, make some new friends. I wouldn't have to, you know, be around, ironically, I wouldn't have to be around all the Scientology stuff. <laughs> by joining the Sea Org. This, this was the thought process that I had. And so I asked her, hey, you know, and I convinced her, oh, yeah, I want to, you know, it's, I, it's the purpose is calling me and all that kind of stuff. And sure enough, you know, I joined the Sea Org at age 14, signed that billion-year contract and uh, started at, uh, for the Scientology people listening, I was in the FSO at FLB. Uh, I was the senior CS in assistant so uh to, to normal humans what that means is i was basically um an assistant at the beginning like the lower levels of the highest echelons of scientology so in that world i was nobody but if you went to like somewhere in kansas some scientology place some little you know place they would probably think i was like you know really have my stuff together so Really what it was is I was running around getting PC folders and, you know, doing little errands for a guy who who was the, you know, case supervisor. And uh, that lasted for only a few months before uh, I dropped out of it because obviously it wasn't really what I wanted to do. And then, and then my mother basically sent me back to the ranch. So I got sent to the ranch the second time uh, when I was 14. Wow, so you're back at Mace Kings at 14 after Sear didn't work out for you. Now, this is Mace Kingsley, New Mexico. Yeah, so the, the one that I got sent to when I was eight years old was the original one, which was in Palmdale, California, just outside right. of L.A. And that's right. the one that was run by Wally Hanks and uh, Sherry Faust and um, Carol Kingsley were the, were the three sort of people running it. And that's the one that, you know, um, had the paddling and the, the more physical abuses of the kids, oh, the molestations. Yeah. Um, what, was, what was Wally the, uh, Wally Hanks the monster everyone made him out to be? Well, the short answer to that is, yeah. Uh, you know, and I'm, I'm not, 
you know, as we talk further, I think people will will get from me that I, it's, I'm not a very polarized thinker. But yeah. Wally is one of those people that was pretty much how people describe him. He was a very large, very loud guy um, with a deep voice, uh, and he was an ex-Marine. You know, he would love to tell stories about how his helicopter had gotten gunned down in Vietnam. And, you know, uh, he was like a war hero in, in his, you know, uh, stories. And he had a, a very large wooden paddle on the wall that was called the Board of Justice. And it yeah. had holes drilled, drilled through it for aerodynamic, you know, purposes. Yeah. And all, all along the sides of the board were tiny little notches. And those notches, once, you know, when you get paddled, you carve a little notch on the side of it. And there was like... A hundred of them by the time I showed up, and the thing had only been open for three years, two and a half years by the time I showed up. So that should give you an idea of how many paddlings he was doing. And um, and and the thing is that there's a video, you know, there's an audio uh, clip of him paddling a, a, a guy named uh, Marco, a kid yeah, named right. Marco. Yeah. And the thing that people don't really realize, and it's kind of unfortunate that there wasn't more recording devices back then, um, is that the paddle was not actually the worst uh, punishment back then. It's just the sort of easier to talk about and most clear, clearly defined one. That was the go-to uh, major punishment, but it wasn't the worst punishment there. And um, so uh, I, I received some of the worst punish, you know, the, the worst punishments than that. I also received the paddle and, and other lighter sentences and all that, you know, obviously I cover in the book, but um, there were definitely worse things than the paddle. And, and Wally was, he was, he was a Scientologist. And when you get paddled, when you get um, punished, First of all, he never called it punishment. He always called it penalty. You, yeah. You're getting penalized. This is your penalty because, you know, uh, there's like, yeah, I think it's in the ethics books or uh, where basically they're saying like, you know, the difference between penalizing and pun punishment, something like that. And so he would be clear to make sure that everybody knows that it's penalty. And, you know, Scientology was incorporated into everything. It's not like he would just say, oh, you did something wrong. I'm going to hit you with this stick. It was like an official muster with where he would read the KRs and commendations, and then he would read from the ethics books to show you which you know condition you're in and what what your overt was, and then carry out your penalty while you're staring at this um, picture of L. Ron Hubbard on the wall, and um, you know the whole thing was deeply intertwined with with Scientology. But he was to answer your question. Yeah, in my view, he was he was that bad. But these are the kind of things that's so unfair where you have an educational setting where kids are subject to physical violence, Nathan. Wally basically had impunity to do whatever he wanted at Mace Kingsley, didn't he? He couldn't get fired. He couldn't get punished. There was never a parent that, that complained about Wally that I ever knew of, ever. Um, wow. First wow. of all, they it, it's... I mean, the kids were sent there to be, you know, corrected and re-indoctrinated, re re-educated into Scientology. Um, and for the most part, even at the New Mexico ranch, almost every single kid that was sent there, their parents knew exactly what they were sending them to. Um, I, I told my mom that he was paddling us, and she, she talked to him and then basically told me I was out of ethics and left me there. So, um, you know, they knew. And then, you're right, there's no... You, He's not going to get fired because that's the thing he was there to do. And he actually uh, eventually did get fired, but it wasn't for paddling. Um, he uh, basically, what happened is that um, the way that the original ranch closed is two girls had reported being molested by him. Um, and they, re they, they reported it to what we call the student staff which is basically a kid that's there, but he's been there so long and, and he's like, you know, he's in ethics enough that now he kind of works there. And so they reported it to this kid and the kid said like, all right, we're out of here. And he, he and those two girls stole horses and rode away from the ranch to the nearest payphone, weirdly. And 
called Carol Kingsley, and um, Carol Kingsley and Sher and Sherry Faust came to the ranch, uh, and basically, you know, they flew out there and confronted Wally, basically, and Wally admitted it after a couple hours. He admitted to molesting these children, and then, um, and then, so they they took him out. And they said, okay, well, you know, you can't run the ranch. And then they took over the ranch and they put the kids who ran away, they put them in, in lower conditions and punished them. And then Wally spent the remaining, you know, uh, 20 some odd years or whatever it was of his life in uh, Spokane, Washington, running a yacht club, uh, like a youth yacht program. Yeah. And... Carol Kingsley and other Scientologists continued to send him children to go on this yacht program, including children that I, I knew. I knew them before and after they went, and they told me all about it, and there's pictures and everything. And so this is another thing that Scientology tries to lie about or mislead about. I mean, even, the, even on the um, attack video that they made about me, the attack page, they... Talk, they they don't name him, but they just say like, oh, an, an individual, you know, and, and he was, you know, removed from the church and everything like that. But um, in my later years of life, in 2008-ish, somewhere around there, um, I went into the Celebrity Center and asked them about Wally Hanks specifically. And they looked him up on the computer and they said, you know, long story short, he's not declared. He's, has, there's no, like, you know, notices or warnings about him. He's totally in good standing. Everything's fine with him. Um, and so Carol Kingsley and Sherry Faust covered up child molestation and then continued to support the person who molested these children and then just acted like it never happened and continued the ranch. Then the, uh, like, the, the government... I can't remember exactly which branch it was, the Department of Education or the um, maybe Child Protective Services, they started looking into the Mace Kingsley Ranch in Palmdale. And so what they did is they just moved the ranch. They they went through a, a, a transitional period of the ranch history, um, which started as a period known as the trailers, where everybody was on uh, in these trailers, basically. And they had a location in Tahoe, and then they had a location in a place called Agua Dulce. And then basically they tried to figure out what to do and they sort of drove across the country in these trailers and then they ended up, uh, you know, settling in New Mexico and buying this, this large property. And that became the second major, uh, you know, second and final major version of the ranch called the New Mexico Ranch. And so that's actually the story of how they got from California to New Mexico. And people always say stuff like, oh, well, how come, you know, if all this stuff happened, how come nobody ever tried to stop them? And the answer is, they did. They did try to stop them, right? The, the government didn't get reports. The police didn't get reports of the molestation because it was covered up. But they caught wind that something weird was going on, and they went to go inspect them. And then basically they just said, oh, oh everything's fine here. We're all cool, and then ran out the back door and left the state. Yep, flee the jurisdiction is the rule number one in Scientology when there's criminal behavior. Now, you, did you go uh, during this migration? Did you wind up out in New Mexico? No, I left just before, uh, just before it basically the California one started their transition. So I knew the kid that you, the student staff kid that those girls went to report this to, I know him. I knew him. He was also at the New Mexico ranch. I knew him from both ranches, and I still know him today. And so I have a recorded interview with him where he, he agreed to kind of tell me the entire story. And um, and I've also heard it from other, other people, actually, but he was the one that was there, so I wanted to get it straight from the horse's mouth. And so that's how I know the details of exactly what, what happened afterwards. I mean, I even know the cities and the names of the people and everything. So um, I, uh, I was there when they were, you know, when they were in Palmdale stably, and then I was there again when they were in New Mexico stably. You know, I, Nathan, I'm glad you mentioned that you got a recording of this, of this young man talking about what happened. And I just want to interject, part of the reason I do uh, podcasts is I consider them part of the oral history 
of the Church of Scientology, people telling their stories. And, you know, because people who were there can listen to it. They can get information they didn't know. And, and even, if, even if people have their own subjective version of what happened, the aggregate of oral histories are very important. And in the future, when people are researching Scientology long after it's cratered, which I, it's inevitably headed toward cratering, it's self-destructive as a function of its own DNA, right? But I'm glad you interviewed him. I think that it's important that people like us do interviews. People like you write books. I'm working on a book. So I'm glad you got those details. They are yeah. important to get. Yeah. Now, now where, where do you wind up? I, I mean, at some point, and it's hard to believe because you seem like you have it together, but at some point, do you leave Scientology and wind up on the streets? Yeah, so the first time that I was at the ranch was eight months, a little more than eight months when I was eight years old. And then, you know, now we're zooming ahead to when I was 14, uh, after the Sea Org, I got sent back to the ranch. And um, my, my mother specifically requested that I not be allowed to contact anyone in my family for the duration of my stay. And I ended up staying that time for three years. And so I wasn't able to talk to my family in any way for uh, nearly three years. And um, I ended up, quote unquote, graduating from that ranch because I was turning 18, uh, turning 18 soon. And they realized, of course, well, if he turns 18 and walks out the front door, that doesn't look good for us. Right. Well, he's not a, he's not a, a, a he, you know, good statistic. So, um, so all of a sudden, the ranch program just flew by and everything just magically was coming together. And all I really had to do at that point was just, um, you know, bleach my hair blonde and, you know, wear as normal looking shirts as like, you know, try to appear to be like an upstat in ethics type of kid or whatever it was and do a few steps here and there on the program. And all of a sudden I'm done. And so um, I went to live with my mother in Florida. Um, so now I'm 17. And everything went back to the, the same as it was before. I was uh, living with her. She was pressuring me for Scientology auditing and Scientology courses. Um, I, she got me a job working with her at a Scientology company. Um, she introduced me to a girl who became my girlfriend that was also a Scientologist. Um, my girlfriend's father was also a Scientologist and also worked at the same Scientology company that we were all working at. So, as you can see, my entire life just went right back to Scientology. I'm living in Clearwater, working at Scientology Place, girlfriend's a Scientologist, mother a Scientologist, pressure for auditing, pressure for courses. It's, it, it just was back to how everything was before and I just couldn't take it. Um, and then on top of that, I had never had any sort of chance to, you know, voice my um, experiences, get any sort of validation or recognition on the fact that, like, these ranches were abusive and crazy. And it was just it was always me wrong about everything. I'm just the wrong one. I'm the bad kid that, like, everything, you know, caused everything on himself. I pulled everything in. And so I ran away. Um, by that time, in the at the ranch, actually, I'm sort of uh, going back a little bit. At the ranch, when I was 17, um, I started doing drugs. Uh, a um, the pain was kind of too much for me, and one of the student staff that I knew there was able to get drugs in. So I started doing heavy drugs at the ranch: methamphetamines, um, you know, weed, alcohol, LSD, cocaine, and so. I was already developing a drug problem by the time I quote unquote, you know, graduated. And so anyway, I was back at home and I ran away. I just said, I can't take this anymore. And I went to go live with that student staff guy who had since left the ranch. So I know this is getting a little confusing, but basically I was at the ranch, started doing drugs and was just checked out of reality. Like my life is just torture. I can't take it anymore. And yeah. then I, you know, quote unquote graduated, went back home and then I was just clobbered with all the Scientology stuff and after literally like two months I was like all right I can't take this and I just left and I went to go live with this this you know my best friend at the time 
And so what happened then is that um, I took a Greyhound bus, which took about five and a half days uh, from St. Petersburg to uh, Tacoma, Washington. And by the time I got there, the guy, my friend, had lost almost everything somehow, uh, according to him. So we just ended up living out of his car. And um, I contacted my mother and apologized and said I, I wanted to come back. And I felt remorse and I, you know, I, I wanted to try again and, and everything like that. And she told me not only that I couldn't come back and that, you know, nobody in the family wanted me back, but I never to talk to them again. You know, I asked for my aunt's number so I could try to talk to her um, because she had always been nice to me and stuff. And, and, you know, she said, no, you can't have her number. You can't anything. So um, she just said, you know, they don't want me anymore. They don't want me to, to, to contact them anymore. And... Um, so after that call, I fell deeper into the world of, of drugs and um, uh, self-medication. And I basically, you know, kind of went off the deep end with, with that sort of passive effort to suicide by drug use. And I, that started a very long period of my life around seven years of being uh, homeless. So you were like, so this happened when you were 18 and then you, you're in Seattle, you're homeless. And I mean, do you get involved? How do you, how do you support your drug habit? Do you live in shelters? Like, what do you do? What's your daily reality when you're a drug addict? So at that time, that actually started when I was still 17, um, because I left the ranch when I was still 17. So um, I was 17 years old. This is about November of 1999. Um, and I was living in a, a suburb of, of, uh, of Tacoma called Lakewood in, in Washington. And it's very cold in November and December, and etc. So we slept in the car. Um, and he, my friend knew, uh, an acid dealer. So, um, he also knew, knew a speed dealer and a weed dealer. That's two people total. The second was a, a girl that, that, uh, dealt speed and, and smoked a lot of weed and, and sold weed. And so, um, we set up an arrangement where we would sell the girl's weed for her and not keep any profit. And in exchange, she would let us sleep on her couch and she would give us speed for free. And then occasionally she would, you know, uh, she would lend us money if we needed. And so we would borrow money from her and then we would buy LSD. So we, we would buy a vial of acid, which is about 105 to 110 hits of liquid acid. And we would buy it for 90 bucks. And then what we would do is we would sell the acid ourselves. So we're just literally out there looking for people who looked weird. You know, oh, he's got purple hair. Let's go talk to him. And trying to sell them acid. And, um, you know, selling acid is not like being in the Cali cartel. I mean, nobody really buys acid. And then when they do buy it, they just want two hits. You know, I mean, that's like, five, you know, five, ten bucks. So you're not, you're not making any money. So yeah. it takes forever to sell it. So we ended up basically getting into this rhythm where we would sell our acid enough to buy another vial and, a, you know, a little bit of food, you know, McDonald's hamburgers, uh, McDonald's cheese cheeseburgers. They used to have like the 29 cent and the 39 cent special. So we'd buy those and gas for the um, vehicle and, and that's it. And the rest of the money we would, we would, uh, we would buy acid. And then the, the acid that we had that we didn't need to sell to cover the next vial, we would just do. So me and this guy were just doing copious amounts of LSD, um, and then that also we started to move into to speed. So we're doing lots and lots of speed and, and LSD, and and basically, I mean, what's a daily life like at that time was, um, you know, wake up on either on that girl's couch or in the car, uh, wrapped in your leather jacket. Uh, it's freezing, and the you know you have to defrost the windows, and then. Um, uh, pop some LSD. Uh, if you're starving, go to Jack in the Box or somewhere to get a hamburger. And then um, go find a mall 
like the Tacoma Mall and go just sit there in the parking lot or just hang out outside looking for people that look like hippies or punks and then try to sell them uh, acid. And then after a while of doing that, um, you know, go hang out with, with that chick and get some free speed or get some more for weed. Go try to find somebody who wants to buy weed and then um, and then do more acid the entire time. So all day and all night. Uh, tripping out on acid and trying to function and do all that stuff. So that that was the that's the a, a snapshot of the daily life at that point. Sounds like hell. Did you have a lot of trouble with the police? Actually, no. Uh, no. No. No police. Uh, I mean, you know, Lakewood's a very small area. There wasn't really that many cops. Tacoma is more of a, a sort of a police state type of uh, a place. But in, in Lakewood, there really wasn't much going on. I mean, there was a couple of times when we were near police when we were on acid, but uh, you know, thankfully, we didn't get into any trouble. Well, now when you're when you're on acid, and you have a you have a Scientology background, does Scientology ever come up when you're high on acid? I mean, what would you think when you were when I mean, you were self medicating? you know, on a hallucinogenic, did does Scientology ever enter into your thinking? Yeah. Um, well, so unlike most people that I've heard of, there wasn't really any moment in time for me where I just sort of woke up one day and said, oh, well, Scientology was all BS. I still totally believed it at this point. And so it was, a, there wasn't a separation between, uh, you know, church and state, so to speak. There was no Scientology as a subject as being different than reality so i was tripping out viewing things basically as a scientologist would but i did you know there was obviously this painful past of all this these courses and the ranch and the the auditing and the but the biggest thing on my mind wasn't um scientology it was my broken relationship with my mother which i tried to avoid thinking about at all costs and then it was the here and now so it was really I was in this mode of trying to um, escape reality. And when you're escaping reality and drugs, the last thing you want to do is think about reality. And so that's why LSD was such a good fit for me is that it just takes whatever your current circumstances are, you know, some wall in front of you, some chair you're sitting on, whatever it is, and makes that the, the focal point. That's the interesting mm -hmm. thing going on in your life. And so um, I did have some introspective strange trips as i'm sure everyone can imagine but that wasn't the goal and i tried to avoid those actually so i, I mostly became enamored with the with the objects around me and the universe around me as much as i could yeah and that's the function of you just trying to survive uh psychologically uh avoid pain what what breaks what what changes those seven years of living on the streets doing drugs I mean, was there um, an event? So was I did, it gradual? I, it was very gradual. So, um, so basically that, you know, Washington became too cold and just too freezing. Sometime around uh, late January or February or something, we, uh, we decided, okay, it's just cold. We can't sell any drugs. So there's nobody out and everything. So we decided to go back down to Albuquerque, New Mexico, which is where he was from. And so, and he had a bunch of friends. So we drove down there and um, and hooked up with a bunch of his friends. And long story short, that turned into this, you know, even crazier, even wilder period of time in my life where we took it, you know, if you can believe this, we took it even to the next level from there. And we, we, we went just totally overboard and spent you know, a while down there and, you know, seven years here. So I'm going to try to just squish it down. But basically I, I was homeless. I was traveling alone a lot, hitchhiking on the side of the road all over the Western part of the United States, you know, Oregon, Utah, Arizona, California, Washington, um, you know, Montana, Colorado, New Mexico, every, everywhere over there. And, um, uh, I, I, you know, shifted from LSD to methamphetamines, and then um, I had such a bad experience with methamphetamines on one particular uh, instance that I, I kind of stepped back from it with the help of 
of that other kid and, and ironically those asset dealers. And so that happened in Washington. And so I was already kind of like, all right, I don't want to get back into methamphetamines. And LSD had just dried up. Like I just couldn't find any. And so the kids in this, on the streets when you're traveling, most of them what they're into is heroin. So either they just drink or they drink and they do heroin. It's kind of the two major um, factions. And so I, I got into heroin. Um, and that became my vice for a few years. And, uh, and I overdosed and died, basically. And this girl was breathing for me for you know what she described as 10 minutes while the, the ambulance came. And I was purple and blue and all that whole thing. And... Um, to give you a, a point of reference for my state of mind in this period of time, uh, early 2000s, after I OD'd, they put me in jail, um, and then as soon as I got out of jail, I OD'd again within a week. And wow. that time that I OD'd, at, I was with some other junkies, and they had Narcan, which is this injection that they give you that basically it, it just kind of takes you out of the, the heroin immediately. And they gave me that injection. And then I literally just went and popped a bunch of pills and went to a punk show that night and got drunk. Like, I mean, it just, it never stopped. And um, so after a while, I, I had done, you know, I'm just kind of zooming forward a bit. Yeah. By around 2005, 2006, in that area, by that time, I had done almost every drug practically known to man. I mean, at least street drugs. I had done GHB, ecstasy, mescaline, cocaine, crack, you know, all forms of speed, speed, meth, you know, crystal meth. I had eaten speed, smoked it, sniffed it, shot it up. I had done morphine, codeine, oxycontin, uh, you know, Percocets, Roxacet, hydrocodone, uh, you know, you name it. It's a huge, huge list of stuff I'd done. Uh, salvia. And just everything I ever came across, I was just consuming. And the thing is that most of those drugs um, are kind of two categories, okay? You've got drugs like mushrooms where you can do them occasionally, but you're not going to become like a mushroom head. I mean, you're not going to be doing mushrooms every day. It just doesn't happen. It's not addictive, and um, it's just too intense. And so there's those types of drugs that were either too hard to find or... You know, just not really addictive. And then the other major kind of drug when you're on the street is the very addictive ones, you know, like uh, pain pills, which are kind of hard to find. And then you've got heroin, speed, coke, crack. And, you know, those are the those are kind of the four main really addictive ones that you have access to when you're on the streets. So speed, I had already kind of given up on. And I just, I was disgusted by the smell and taste of it, you know, because I'd been away from it so so long and I had such a bad experience. Um, and then Coke, by the time I got into Coke, I had already done so much speed that Coke just seemed like nothing to me. I mean, it just literally seemed like a weird downer drug that just made me feel serious. And so I never really got into Coke. And then um, I got into crack for a while and that really... Crack is a is a tough one because it it, it it's it doesn't it doesn't it doesn't crush you. What it does is it squeezes your mind. It, it it slowly reduces your mind without you really being aware of it. So that even just in a couple of weeks of doing it, you're already at the point of wandering around on the streets looking for shiny objects to sell so you can get another bag at six o'clock in the morning and you, nothing else matters. And that I went through that uh, period and I, and I talk about some of these details in the book, but basically I ended up uh, prostituting myself and becoming just this person that I just wasn't I, you know, I, I just wasn't able to function even as a human anymore. And through some circumstances kind of outside my, my control a bit, I, I kind of got away from it. And, uh, and I just, after a couple of weeks, I really realized like, oh my God, like I was really down there in the bottom echelons of what I ever thought I would be doing. And uh, so I avoided 
crack um, uh, very intentionally, unlike some of the other drugs. I was really like, wow, that is not good. And the other thing about crack that people don't really realize, uh, that I didn't realize until I did a lot of it, is that it's not cheap. It's expensive. It's super expensive. I mean, whenever I saw like you know that TV show Cops, it's always some poor person on a bicycle getting crack, and you just feel like, oh, that must be super cheap. It's not cheap because the high only lasts an hour or two, and so you're out there buying these, you know, twenty bucks a bag, and to get high for at yeah, the most three hours, at most, but it's really about an hour, hour and a half. So I mean, you do the math on that. That's like, you know, you're talking hundreds of dollars a day and it just, yeah. you can't, you can't sustain it. And so that actually kind of helped me because it was so difficult to come up with money for crack. I just didn't know. It just kind of, it helped. So that's what happened with crack. And then with heroin, um, heroin is like the, the opposite of crack, the opposite of speed in a way it's, and, and even in some other ways, the opposite of LSD, because there's no real mental effects, at least for the first, you know, for the bulk of your beginning experience. It's not mental. You just shoot it up and then suddenly every bad thing in the universe has just disappeared and you feel amazing for, you know, the almost the entire day. So it was just such a welcome and refreshing drug to me that I got pretty hooked on it and I got what we call strung out in several uh, states. But the way that I basically got off of heroin is that after I OD'd, like I said, I OD'd again, and then um, my best my best friend on the streets back then was this black kid named Spit with a mohawk and everything. I had met him up in Oregon, and we were hanging out down in Albuquerque by this point, and long story, you know, short, he, he died from heroin right on, to, like, right next to me, leg to leg on a couch, and, wow. um, and so that was a major thing for me and I, I kind of stepped away from heroin and I got myself out of the situation of being able to get heroin um, as I kind of reflected a little bit on my life and then you know a, a couple of days off turned into a week off and then a week off turned into a month off and I just I, I, I ran away from my problems I, I if I felt like doing heroin again I left the city I just hitchhiked to another city I'd never even been to before where I knew I couldn't get heroin and I would just suffer. I would puke and feel horrible and be on the side of the road just I can't eat, can't drink, just suffering and horrible misery. But I knew that I was going to die and so I just suffered through it. And, um, and this is a very long answer but basically that was the process of eliminating drugs from my life. And then I entered this new phase right around, like I said, sort of mid to late 2005, I'm guessing, somewhere in there, where I, I didn't have any drugs left to do. So all I was doing at that point was drinking. And I, you know, I had hooked up with a bunch of punks on the, in Albuquerque, and I was going to these, all these parties and everything. And it just, life, when you're not on drugs and you're in that situation, life starts to become really boring. It's just predictable. It's always the same parties, the same people, the same drama, the same conversations. And it's just... I just started to feel this something new in me, which is that like I I kind of want to do something. I'm yeah. still alive. I'm somehow I'm still alive. I don't know how, but I'm alive. By that point, I had been I had been shot at. I had been somebody pulled a knife on me. I've been I'd been jumped. I've been to jail several times. I'd overdosed multiple times. I had been through a lot, and somehow I was still alive. And I just. I, I didn't really have any major direction on what I wanted to do. I just felt like I want to do something. And that was the beginning of how I actually got out of that, that life. Well, what, what were the first things you did? Did you get a job or move back to Florida? Or, or how do you get back into mainstream? So um, at that point in my life, I was living in a tunnel, uh, like a sewage tunnel under the the streets of Albuquerque and I was a punk rocker covered in spikes and dirty clothes and everything and I had nothing else. I mean, I, ha I had one backpack and I had no social security card. I didn't know my social security number. I didn't have an ID or a birth certificate, a job history, skills, you know, eighth grade education at best. I, you know, I didn't know anybody that wasn't homeless or punk rockers with no money. My family had totally disowned me. I just, 
was nobody, nothing. I had no money, nothing. And um, the only the only money I had came from panhandling, you know, begging on the streets. And um, so that began began kind of the next phase of my life where I tried to figure out how to do anything at all. How do I even do anything? How do I even get a social security card, etc.? So I, um, in the interest of kind of the time, you know, I, I, of course, I cover all this in the book and, and some of it's pretty interesting, I think. But basically, I ended up eventually being able to get um, a social security card and a birth certificate and then an ID. And then I uh, started doing day labor jobs, which is where you basically just sit there at like three o'clock in the morning and hope that some guy shows up and says like, oh, I need somebody to help me, you know, move some trees or whatever they're looking for. And then, oh yeah, I'll give you 40 bucks, whatever it is. Um, but that wasn't successful. And then I went, I applied at some temp agencies where they kind of give you like a two week job working at some, you know, some horrible factory job type of thing or whatever it is. The, the type of job that no literally nobody wants to do and I got a couple of jobs there okay so that was like you know it's always temporary so no, nothing permanent but I worked at like a traditional Chinese medicine store filling bottles I worked at a plastic mold inj uh, injection factory making these little plastic things and um, you know I, I got various different little jobs like that delivering coca-cola to Walgreens and gas stations and stuff like that where I'm just sitting with the driver and he's doing all the work and I'm kind of just helping him offload stuff so those types of little jobs but you can't pay rent on that you can't buy you know you can't really do anything with that but I, no. I used it as I used it as a way to like okay now I'm gonna buy uh, some clothes that look sort of normal and stick them in my backpack and I'm gonna you know try to buy some food and I, you know that kind of thing and, and but really the big gain was I was learning how to work and how to work in really the worst situation that you can think of and um, so then uh, I ended up eventually, you know, I applied to McDonald's and Olive Garden as a dishwasher and Walgreens and all these places I could tr think of. And I got denied from all of them. And then uh, one person that I knew knew somebody that worked at a Wendy's. And so long story short, I got a job at Wendy's as the guy doing the fries. And um, and that was another type of, you know, uh, bad experience being yelled at all the time and you know being the the little weirdo with the tattoos that's you know everyone hates and whatever it is so that was a, a a bit of suffering but i but i pushed through it because you know i didn't know what i wanted to do but laying around in the tunnels shooting up heroin wasn't working and so i just went through it and um and then after that i started to look into like how do i get into school like I know people do school somehow, and um, so I started going down to the vocational s school, and you know, again and again and again, it was so confusing. There's all these rules and lines, and all these you go here, talk to that person, and I eventually started to figure out like the how it basically works, which is that you you fill out this thing called the FAFSA, um, the Free Application for Financial Student Aid. And then you, you know, you can see if you are, are eligible for scholarships and, uh, you know, grants and student loans and this type of thing. And, and my mind by now was slow, very, very slowly starting to, um, you know, uh, be less cloudy and less stormy and less totally victim of the, the, the drug influence. I mean, I was still very what you know, what we would, in Scientology would have called like a biochemical personality. We, I was still very much, I think that's the word, I was still yeah. very much like that. I mean, I was very much like a druggie, but I just wasn't doing drugs and I was slowly, slowly coming out of it. And I was just trying really hard to do something. So um, eventually, I, with the money that I got at, at Wendy's, I got a slightly better job uh, doing like tier one tech support for Earthlink of all companies. Um, hmm. And basically like what that means is you call them up and you say, oh my, you know, internet doesn't work. And the first guy that talks to you just checks like, you know, the, the 10 things that everybody calls about that are super easy. And they just read you off the answers from a checklist. That was me. And if there's any real problems, they bump you up to somebody who actually knows about computers. So I had that job for a, little, for a short time. And then I eventually got into this, um, this vocational school called uh, uh, Albuquerque Technical Vocational Institute. 
and I went for um, computers because somebody at a, a party, when I was telling them, look, this is so boring, I, I got to change my life around, I got to do something, but I don't know what to do. The guy said, well, uh, you know, why don't you do computers? And I, was, and I just, to me, it just sounded as good of an idea as anything else. And I just said, sure, I'll do computers. That sounds like something I could do. And um, so I went to the school for uh, some kind of like computer, you know, program. But long story short, I got in an accident, you know, two months into the thing and had to drop out. And, um, and then I moved to Washington because I was like, I just have to get out of Albuquerque. It's too easy to fall back into the same patterns. I just have to get out. So I moved up to Washington where I had been on the streets and I was enjoyed it up there and everything. And then I kept pushing on school and I eventually got into uh, the cheapest vocational school that they had, which was called Seattle Vocational Institute. And um, the program that I took was called the Network Technician Program, which is the only computer one that they had. And instead of being about network technicians, it was really just like an introduction to computers the entire nine months. So I, um, I had done so much. I put so much effort into trying to get into a school by then that I just wasn't going to accept that. And so I talked to the teachers and they basically said, okay, look, you do your curriculum and we will give you projects to do. We want you to um, build a, a, a Linux bind DNS server. And we don't exactly know what that is or how to build it, but we'll buy you books. We'll give you servers. We'll give you workstations. And you just wow. figure it out. And for nine months, I did projects like that and taught myself Linux and networking and um, you know general computing and how hardware and software works. And I just gave myself this enormous crash course in, in the basics of you know, what I would later know to be called systems and network administration. And so uh, by now it's, you know, 2007 and I'm, I'm finally finishing that up. And, um, and with the student loans and the grant, I was able to uh, cover a small portion of rent. And, you know, I was living with my girlfriend at that time. So this is right around the area where I would say I was probably getting, you know, more or less not homeless anymore. It's right around this period where I actually could sort of sustain myself. Okay, it's an amazing story using education to, to literally bootstrap yourself out of drug addiction and homelessness and despair. Now, but as you're doing it, as you're becoming successful in life, your your psychological, spiritual state must be improving. You have you have hope again in your life. I mean, is that what you feel like? I'm going to make it. I'm going to survive. Um, at that point in my life, I wasn't really thinking that that clearly about you know, okay, what's the future going to be? I was just really dedicated to, I guess, I guess, kind of moving my addiction from from drugs to something else, and that other thing became computers. And so I was really just focused on the computers, so much so actually that the girl that I was with at that time ended up breaking up with me because I never wanted to go out, I never wanted to do anything, I didn't want to meet people, I didn't want to hang out, I didn't want to be cool. The only thing I wanted to do was sit there and work on the computer all the time, all day, every night. And um, and I, you know, I feel bad for her in retrospect because she helped me a lot, but, but that's the degree that I was addicted to these things. I was just teaching myself how to operate these things. Um, and I wasn't really thinking about, oh, this is going to lead to something until about the end of that nine months of, of school where they offered me a, a position there to kind of teach the students. And um, I think they offered me like 15 bucks an hour or something. And I remember thinking at that time, I bet I could do better than that. I bet I could do better than that now. <laughs> and so I didn't take it. And I went and I instead got a job on, off Craigslist at a company down in Tukwila, Washington, um, that was a Linux hardware distributor, basically. And I, you know, and, and that was really the beginning of my tech, techn you know, my technology career really started at that school. And when I got that first job. And then I basically went from that job down, then I moved down to LA to kind of try to reconnect with my history. And, and I got an even better job down there and I stayed for a couple years there. And then I, um, um, by the end of that job, I was 
you know, actually good at computers. Um, and then I went from that job, I, I found another Craigslist job, which was another systems administration job. And that was at a visual effects company uh, that does, you know, CG for, for major motion pictures and whatnot. So that was down in Venice, California. And then they moved to Santa Monica. And then, um, and then I got headhunted from that um, uh, job. You know, basically this uh, producer and uh, supervisor started their own company and said like, hey, we want you. What's it gonna take? You're gonna have to move out to Utah because that's where the startup is, is happening. But what would it take to get you from this job? And I just gave them this list of demands. I mean, by then I was already, uh, you know, very uh, competent in, in the area that I was working in. Um, a visual effects uh, a systems administration, network administration. Um, and so I just told them like, oh, take this much money. I want a month off. I want, you know, no, I don't have to listen to anybody. I make all the decisions. I, you know, have uh, equity and, you know, because I already had a nice job. So I was just telling them, okay, well, if you gave me this, I would leave. And I just listed everything I could possibly think of. And then they just wrote back like, okay, we'll write it up. And so, um, wow. So then I moved out to Utah for that job, and then um, that they basically the startup eventually dissolved. Um, but before it did, they had they got this I, sort of last ditch idea of like, hey, we we know this Chinese investor, and he is saying, hey, maybe we should do a merger with this company in China. And so they flew me out to China to check out the situation technically and see what the feasibility of it was. And then uh, I just ended up leave, stay, uh, staying in China. And then I traveled around for a couple of years in Asia and then um, came back to China and um, uh, started working at another visual effects company. Uh, and I started kind of as like a systems administrator type and then uh, took the position of IT manager, and then I got promoted to the IT director, and then uh, finally was the, the chief technology officer. So um, I was, you know, we have six cities, so that's like, you know, uh, it's six cities in three countries, and I was managing a team of, you know, just under 100 people in English and Chinese in six cities, all technical staff. So um, I kind of reached the sort of pinnacle of, of my, I think my, probably my technical trajectory, and um, I just actually resigned from that position um, uh, at the beginning of this month. So I spent four years there, and now I'm I'm out there in the world. Um, and kind of that's, I mean, it's a very long-winded answer, but that's sort of the trajectory of how I got out of uh, homelessness. That's an amazing story. I, Nathan, very few people make it out of, you know, homelessness, poverty, despair, drug addiction, as, as well as you did. And that shows the, you know, the strength of, of character, uh, that there's always redemption possible. That no matter how bad it is, you can always improve your life day, day by day by day by day by day. One thing that got my attention, the name of your book, Scythe Telepo, what does the title mean? I did a little research on what book titles should be and what you should and shouldn't do. And kind of the top two rules are, number one, don't call your book title something that's hard to remember. And number two, don't call it anything that's hard to spell. And I, I thought about, yeah, I could call it something catchy and that will maybe help sales. But I'm only going to write this story once. This is the story of what happened with me. And if I were going to call this book something, this is what I would call it, Psych Telepo, because this is what encapsulates the story. So that's a little bit of background on why is it such a weird name. Now, what does it actually mean? Um, it's revealed in the book, obviously, um, but I can tell you that the sort of literal translation would be death from the from the stars and it's it's in reference to to a culmination of the the compounding of darkness inside my mind it the the sort of 
you know, existence that I was in is that I had to store all this darkness inside me. I, I, I never had anybody to, to get it out with. And it just built up and built up. And I had no real release. And I tried various things. I tried to commit suicide when I was nine and, and again when I was 15. And, um, you know, I, I, it just, uh, again, uh, sorry, again when I was 11. And then again when I was 15. And I just had no way out. And eventually, through Scientology auditing, the darkness, let's say, manifested in a way that just that justifies that name, Psych Telepo. And I don't want to spell it out too much clearer than that, but basically it's an integral part of my story that's revealed in chapter 12 and it's uh it's it's something that i realize i could have called it something a lot more catchy like you know uh you know escaping scientology or something but um i just figured you know what i'm only gonna name this thing once i'm just gonna do it what i would call it the object for me is not to make a bunch of sales it's to get my story out there in the right way and this is the right way for me you know Nathan, what would you have to say to, pe to young people who are in the Church of Scientology and they feel trapped and they don't know how to get out? What would you say to them? They're 16, 17, they're trapped, they feel like there's nothing but Scientology and there's no hope. They'll lose everything if they leave. What lifeline can you throw them, how, especially having gone through the hell you, you've gone through and the redemption? my my relationship with my mother um deteriorated uh and eventually we weren't on speaking terms and then she died uh and uh she died about eight years ago now and she died at, at during a time when we were totally you know she had totally disconnected from me and um and we were you know the last thing, message i ever told her was a, a very hateful email because basically she she didn't she went out of her way to deny any help to me to try to go to school i contacted her when i was trying to go to school and so i had to wait another year because she was unwilling to help me do my fafsa so anyway if i look back on my life um i'm 36 now and when i look back on how everything went you know a lot of people have different views on my life um and my view continuously evolves but i would say this to any kids out there 16 17 even 14 right even however young you are where you're starting to feel like okay this is really not working out what am i supposed to do i would say this you need to think carefully about a couple of things number one this is very hard to understand when you're that age and it's hard to accept but number one is that you're kind of stupid. You're young and you're dumb and you don't really understand what the world's about. And that's fine. But you just need to have a little less certainty about what you think um, the right action is. Okay, so don't be so sure. Because like going into the CR to avoid it, that was a really bad mistake. Trying to get an emancipation, that was a mistake. You know, I made many mistakes that seemed like the right thing at the time. I was sure of them. Don't be so sure. Okay, that's number one. Number two, I would say, think about in 20 years when you're, how you view yourself, you know, you think that you're old in 20 years if you're 14, but think about how you're going to feel then about your family. I know you don't, you know, maybe you're, you're, you don't like them now or it's, it's very difficult with them now, but do you just want to never ever see them again? Do you just want to ha not have them in your life at all? Think about that. It's because that's a reality. And then the third thing I would say is um, figure out a way to gracefully make the changes to your life that you need. And keep in mind that there are people that I know to this day that are not Scientologists, but they still have a family connection. They still know their family. They still talk to them. They still have parents. And... The way that they do that is they decide that they're not going to speak out about it and they're not going to go public with it because they would rather have their connection with their family. Um, I know people that 
did make the connection, you know, did make those complaints with their family and eventually got parts of their family out of it. But then they end up with a broken family situation. So the, the overall message is this. Try to be strategic about it. Don't be emotional. Just think about what it is that you actually want that is achievable. If what you want is, oh, I want my family to stop doing Scientology, well, that's maybe possible, but it's going to be very difficult, and you're going to have to do it in a, in a methodical, conscious, you know, planned out way. You're going to have to do it in a calm, long-term plan way. You can't just react and yell at your mom and yell at your dad and whatever. you got to really think about it. So I know it's very general and it's not very specific, but that's the kind of that's the kind of message that I really would have liked to receive when I was young, which is like, look, you think you know something, you don't. Stop all your trains of thought, assume that they're probably wrong, and just start again and figure out what it is that you think is going to be how you want to live in 10 or 20 years when it comes to your family. And then you're going to start to know what to do. If what you want to do is just escape them no matter what, and you don't care if you have a family anymore, you're probably wrong. Because you know what? I don't have a family, and it's not fun. You know, people go, oh, you, you made it out. Isn't that great? Or people say, oh, you're so lucky. Or You know, I get that all the time. And it's, it's really, it's maddening. It's really maddening when people say how lucky I am. Because it's like, I slaved away at the worst jobs possible and, and, and danced with the devil and died and had the, in some ways, the worst ma life I can imagine for myself. It was not luck. It was not fun. It wasn't cool. You know, there wasn't anything great about it. It was just a life that was rough and, and, um, and difficult. So if you if that's what you think you really want, then I think you're probably confused. You know, if you're a kid, it's not a life that you want. What you want to do is figure out a way to get the real life that you actually think is possible that you want when, with regards to your family. And I appreciate your, your your wisdom to be strategic and not emotional or impulsive. Another way of saying that is to count the cost. Look at if you're willing to pay the cost. I've actually told people it's smarter to stay under the radar. Keep your family together. Take care of your family, your finances. Things come in time. And so everyone has to make those decisions themselves. And if people who have never had to pay a cost for leaving Scientology, it's abstract. They don't understand how bad it can get, what the cost can really be. So I, I appreciate your wisdom to be strategic and not emotional. So the name of the book is Scythe Telepo, My Survival of a Cult, Abandonment, Addiction, and Homelessness by Nathan Rich. Nathan, thank you so much for coming on the show. Look forward to hearing from you again. I think you have a lot to say. I'd like to get into some more of the details uh, with you, but thank you again for being on the show. Yeah, thank you a lot, Jeffrey. This was a great conversation. I mean, there's always, you know, a lot of stuff we can talk about. Um, I hope people check out the book. By the way, I have enabled uh, sharing. So if you have the book, I encourage you to share it with somebody else, the ebook. It's free. Um, my goal is to have people read it, and if they can learn something about my life from it, if there's something useful in their lives, for, you know, that they can apply, then that's what I want to know about. I want to hear about it. I want to help people. That's the message of this book. And so I, I really encourage people to to read it and share it and, you know, write reviews and just kind of, um, you know, give it the attention that, that I think it, it's it, it, it needs um, and it, it, it was a pleasure let's do it again and uh, you know good luck everybody okay. and thank you Nathan and for surviving Scientology radio this is your host Jeffrey Augustine thank you so much for listening and as always we'll be in very good touch <laughs>